Wow, that's that's blurry. Hang on. Ah, that's better. Most of you, and even me, take it for granted. If you wear glasses or you don't, you probably have good eyesight. But there's a certain population who, even with glasses, they can't see that well. And after a year in this job, I really want to share my experience as a low vision optometrist. So kia ora and welcome. My name is Siobhan. I'm an optometrist working in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I've been working as an optometrist for about six years. So now the introduction's out of the way, let's jump straight in. So what is low vision? I mean, it's strange, right? When I first heard about low vision, it didn't really make sense to me. I thought that glasses made everyone see well. And if you didn't have glasses and you needed them, you were essentially blind. Well, not quite. Okay, so you can wear glasses and you still can't see that well. So there's two main reasons why people can't see well. It's the first and most common reason is because they need glasses to be able to focus. The second reason, and not so rare, but a lot more debilitating, is that someone has an eye disease that doesn't allow them to see well. Great, and we can actually divide the eye diseases down to two categories. So you've got eye diseases that are treatable and some eye diseases that aren't treatable. So the ones that are treatable, for example, are cataract. So cataract is when the lens becomes blurry in the eye and it's a simple surgery, which is actually the most done surgery in the world, where they replace the lens in the eye with a new plastic lens. So that's treatable. There's other types of diseases that have no treatment. One example is macular degeneration. Hey guys, Siobhan from the future, correcting Siobhan from the past. I just want to say with macular degeneration, there is a treatment for the neovascular form or the wet form that involves an injection. Um, but typically for the dry form or when you get those geographic atrophy, the vision loss is usually permanent. You can't really recover that back. So just want to make sure that that point is clear. Clear degeneration affects the center of your vision and that's where your vision can degrade slowly over time and that can stop you from seeing people's faces or recognizing people's faces from across the street. It can even make you unsafe to drive. Just imagine that. Imagine not being able to see clearly, not being able to do these very basic tasks. That's an everyday life of a low vision patient. And what we do at the low vision clinic is we try and rehabilitate people who have eye diseases like this, which can really affect their daily life. And just a quick overview, in the low vision clinic, what we're trying to do is when we try and rehabilitate people, we're trying to find strategies that they can take to live a normal life despite what's going on with their eyes. So why did I become a low vision optometrist and how did I become a low vision optometrist? So I had about four to five years of experience. I mainly worked in retail optometry. So that's basically selling glasses and doing routine eye exams. Then I saw an advertisement for a position at the low vision clinic. And I thought I was getting a little bit bored of retail optometry. I could just do a day at the low vision clinic. So instead of working, imagine I've got a fortnight, I've got 10 days per fortnight, working 10 days in retail, I could take one day off, so work nine days at my normal job, and have one day every fortnight to work at the low vision clinic, which by the way was a paid job, and the low vision clinic job actually paid more hourly than my job out in private practice. But that's a that's for another time. And so what I did was I applied for the job, I got interviewed, and I got the job. And there was actually quite a bit of delay to getting started into that job, but I got in nonetheless. So what does a low vision optometrist job entail? Well, I guess it's best explained through the patient experience. So the patient's booked in usually for an hour appointment. First, they see the occupational therapist. Now, the occupational therapist I worked with was absolutely amazing. She made the job so much easier. So the occupational therapist would run through a questionnaire and ask certain questions about how they're finding their eye problem, how they're finding their day-to-day -day routine and their daily life. And the occupational therapist would actually give, basically give really good solutions. So for example, if someone struggled with cooking and they weren't able to see the knob, um, the suggestion would be to put um, spots on the knob to be able to touch where the temperature would be at. Another thing the occupational therapist therapist would do is um, they would organize a home visit and the home visit was essentially to make sure the house was well lit because if you have a well lit house it can make it a bit easier to navigate and see things. Now after now usually the patient would see the occupational therapist for about half an hour to an hour and then the occupational therapist would hand the patient over to me and now the occupational therapist because they did a really good job they'll come with a list of things and all I had to really do was explain things check things and just reassure the patient on certain aspects about the eye now I don't want to stress enough I think the occupational therapist if, if, if they're watching this they made the job so easy for me it was a delight to work at this kind of job okay but at the same time I don't want to undermine what I did even the fact that I didn't really have to do much, didn't have to check many things, because most of these patients were referred from the eye department or ophthalmology, so they've already had a very thorough assessment. Some of them are referred from other optometrists, so they've already had the thorough assessments. And you didn't really have to check the prescription, because if you did a new prescription, it's not going to make it much better. So as the optometrist, we also introduced the patient to low vision aids. These can include magnifiers, they can include electronic magnifiers like a CCTV. But we also talked through some practical advice. So one example is using eccentric fixation, that's where you try and use your peripheral vision to be able to see. Really simple things is like the pace test. So 
if someone's struggling to see the TV, instead of saying, just get closer to the TV, you do something called the pace test where it sounds quite scientific. You get a person just to take a step forward and if they can see it, then they can put the chair there. If they can't, they step, take another pace forward, see if they can see the, the, the chair. So these are kind of the strategies that we come up with and what we explain to patients. And therein lies the most important thing. So a lot of these patients that go through the system, it's really quick. Um, and a lot of them actually don't know what their, their eye problem is. So for example, if they've had macular degeneration, um, a lot of people think they're gonna go completely blind. But that's not necessarily the case. So in macular degeneration, you don't lose your entire vision, you only lose your central vision. You maintain some of that peripheral vision. And that's really important to know because the peripheral vision is what's being used instead of the central vision to be able to do most of these tasks and strategies that we need to undertake in order to live with this particular eye disease. And I guess working in low vision, we had that time to explain things to people where if they're in a hospital setting, it can be quite busy in a hospital setting and the specialists don't have the time to maybe explain things in thorough detail to a patient's liking and that's where we have the opportunity to do that at the low vision clinic which I found it to be really rewarding because just explaining what the problem is puts people at ease and rest and in some ways you're more of a counselor which is really good because you understand the eyes really well and if you're able to combine that with good listening skills and communication it can really make a patient feel a lot better about their situation as opposed to i'm sure a counselor will do a really good job but the counselor doesn't have strong understanding of eye problems and eye diseases and another thing that low vision optometrist does is communicate with the doctor the referring optometrist or ophthalmologist or the referring ot or occupational therapist we even write letters to the blind low vision new zealand to explain the patient's situation so i feel very fortunate and grateful that i've been in a position that i'm able to educate patients about their eyes and to be able to guide them through what I think is probably the toughest thing that anyone could go through. Now I want to take this time to explain what patients are and the particular outcomes you get. Now a typical low vision patient could be any age. They could be children, they could be middle aged, they could be elderly. They're typically elderly because of macular degeneration and more things go wrong with your eyes as you get a bit older. Now some most of these patients are the most inspiring people I've ever met. Despite the problems that are going on with their eyes, they're still able to wake up every day and go through the business and the motions. And I want, and I want to take this time to talk about the outcomes. Some of the outcomes aren't that great because most of the problems occur with the elderly patients and with elderly patients it's harder for them to find a way to adapt as opposed to someone who's a bit younger if you're a bit younger you're able to use technology and leverage technology and learn a bit faster that can be a bit tough but I guess the way around this, or I guess to think around this, is that set expectation is quite low. Um, most people aren't going to get the outcome that they want, but there are some people who are really going to find your work rewarding. They're going to be so grateful for the work. And mind you, with the low vision service, uh, it was through Canterbury District Health Board, the hospital. So a lot of people who were seen, it didn't cost them a penny or a cent. Um, and you're able to provide that really high level of care. I think, I think really focus on the patients who you can really impact. And I think even if you saw 100 people, you weren't able to do much, but if one person got a benefit, that's a victory in itself. And now one thing you, that can be done to combat this is if someone had a very slight degradation in their vision due to macular degeneration, let's say they're still able to drive, but they're getting a slight deterioration in macular degeneration, that will be a good opportunity to be referred to the low vision clinic. Um, they may not need any low vision aids, but the benefit is that if they're seen at the low vision clinic, they know that if vision does get worse there is a next step rather than if they lose their vision completely they actually their mood drops and when they do get introduced to services like us because if you have a low mood it's difficult to motivate yourself to learn these techniques versus if you're seen a bit sooner you know these things ex exist so if you do have a decline in vision you can approach us to help you out great so i hope you enjoy this video i'll link a video about my likes and dislikes in optometry take care and talk soon